Please rise from the invocation and remain standing <clears throat> for the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Lord, help us to understand and proclaim the truth, that not by might and not by power, but by thy spirit alone can man prevail. Grant unto all men and nations the blessings of liberty, justice, and peace. Let injustice and oppression cease and hatred and cruelty pass away. Amen. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> call regular session number seven to order. Roll call, please. Councilmember Forte. <clears throat> Councilmember Sive? Here. Councilmember Marino? Here. Councilmember Faith? Here. Councilmember Mosby? Here. Councilmember Carlisle? Here. Councilmember Benny? Present. Councilmember Edson? Here. <clears throat> you have before you an agenda. I am a, been advised that item 4A, which is bill number 16-49, is to be continued to a date of August 4th. Therefore... Is there a motion to the, approve the agenda as amended? Mr. Mayor, I would move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the agenda as amended. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Uh, before we get into public comment, I would like to advise that we have a Boy Scout with us this evening, and he is working on his citizenship in the community badge. Welcome. And hopefully, with you being here, the council will be particularly well behaved this evening. <laughs> um, first item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anybody in chambers who care to address the council this evening? And again, please come to the microphone because these are recorded. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan Kaufman. I live at 306 Northeast Quarter. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor and city council for letting me come up and speak today. Um, I'm reading this because if I said it out loud, I would, I would go on forever. So I know you have some time that you need to use. I so appreciate the time and the effort that each of you put into representing your districts. The compensation you receive does not reflect the amount of quality work you do for this community. Ethics is defined as a rule of behavior based on ideas what is morally good or bad. It involves making the right decision for the right reasons, no matter what the consequence. Even the most ethical person, however, among us missteps sometimes. None of us is perfect, and that is why grace is needed. Most of the members of the council I am proud to call my friend. The others don't know me well enough, or I don't know them, or haven't worked with them enough to know them. Um, the measure of an ethical person is the majority of their life accomplishments, however. Each of you know that I have witnessed living this kind of life even before you were on council. Councilman Faith, Councilman Benny, Councilman Seif, we were on 2009 Lee Summit 360 Citizens Group, which helped determine the city plan. Many hours were spent on this volunteer project. Councilman Benny, Councilman Woman Forte, Seif, and Edson belong to the Rotary Club of Lee Summit, and each have been involved on service committees as well as Councilwoman Sipe was the president of the club. Councilwoman Forte, you through your business before you were on city council, donated the awards to the mayor's character breakfast, <coughs> even though it was um, criticized by your partners, and we so appreciate that. Councilwoman Edson and Sipe saved the Holly Festival, which benefits the D.A.R.E. program, and I have worked with both of them on the Taste of Lee Summit and the Lee Summit Educational Foundation fundraiser. There, was so, there is so much more to this list of accomplishments by these wonderful people so, um, that I know so well, which started long before city council. But I don't want to go on forever. Councilman Mosby, I have attended your citizens' meetings and seen the respect your, your constituents have for you. And I appreciate your openness to open yourself up to those 50 or so people that come and, and talk to you each time. 
Councilman Carlisle, I haven't had the opportunity to work with you, but I have appreciated your wisdom and questioning on different issues. Councilman Marino, you have presented that you have found a flaw in the procurement process. Because of you, the process will be examined. I share this thought, these thoughts because this council has, hasn't had time to get to know each other well. So I thought some background on the altruistic nature of our council would be appropriate for not only you, but for the citizens of Lee Summit to know that there are truly good people on the council, truly good people. Thank you again to this council for what you do for this community and the hard decisions you have to make sometimes. Please, no response is needed to this comment. This comment is more a reflection on this community and how we care for each other. I simply ask that you take time for that we all take time for reflection before we speak. Is it the truth? <clears throat> is it fair to all concerned? <clears throat> will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all? Thank you. Thank you. Are there other <clears throat> Thank you. Are there other public comments this evening? If so, please come to the microphone. Either either microphone, whichever is convenient. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll make this real brief. Um, I'm more actually. I'm addressing this question to you, uh, Mayor Rhodes, because if I'm not mistaken, you do the appointments. I do uh, for what? For committees. No, sir. It's the mayor pro tem. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just a pretty face. It's okay. Funny. All right. <laughs> Rob, Rob's not too bad. I'm sorry. Okay. Can we have your name, please? Um, I'm sorry. My name's Steve Lathrop. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to find out when you do the appointments for committees, is there a vetting process, uh, background process as far as, say, the committees those people are being appointed to, um, especially things that deal with financial you know, budget committee and what is there? Is there some kind of background check? Something you look into people's backgrounds, uh, see what they've done, how they've handled the, their own fiscal responsibilities in order to turn over one of the larger municipal budgets in the state to those people. Mr. Lathrop, if I might, it, typically this is a public comment section where where comments are made. Um, okay. And then there's a, a council comment section, and I'd be happy to to address briefly there if you'd like, or I can catch you afterwards and, and Oh, okay. I, I call, I've never attended one of these. That's okay. No, just, no, no, that's what I'm saying. I thought an open forum, forum, I just was asking kind of yeah. how that appointment process works, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Paul, I should have set the stage. Uh, we, we don't know what people are going to say, and a lot of times we're not prepared to respond. It's okay. not that we're being rude. It's just you raise questions and... Okay. I mean, anybody for the so it's a legitimate person. question. Just this isn't the appropriate. Well, no, time. it's that, mm -hmm. we just don't expect a response just yet. I think you'll get one. But okay, okay. That's just more for explanation for everybody. Because okay, oh, well, I appreciate your time. I appreciate then. that. Sorry. Thank you Sorry very about much. that. Thank you. That's fine. Are there other public comments? Thank you. Any council comments this evening? Very good. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. My name is Marion Zajic. I live at 604 Northwest Ashley, uh, Lee Summit 64081. I just want to speak from the heart tonight in that I am appalled at the way this city council has been run the last month or so. The forum that has been presented has been disturbing, not what our council is expected to do or to be. This is not a place where you bring forth issues of a person's character that can be handled behind closed doors. If you, if you have issues that are disturbing to you, then you need to take care of them someplace other than on this council floor. This is a place for Lee Summit business. And the business is not being taken care of because of the antics of a few council members. 
That's all I have to say. Other public, please. Other, uh, is there other public comment this evening? Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Any council comment? Point of privilege. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, if we can have Thank you. Um, and I see no further public comments. So is there any council comments? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I might real quickly, I just to address Mr. Lathrop's question. Uh, the charter requires that the mayor pro tem with the advice and consent of the council uh, appoint the committees. So uh, a quick snapshot is once uh, I was elected mayor pro tem, basically spent the better part of two and a half, three weeks trying to uh, meet with each council member, sometimes more than once get ideas of their interests, the things that they wanted to serve on, um, what their experience and backgrounds were. And then in doing that, trying to find a way to uh, allow senior or experienced members of council to provide leadership, um, but also allow opportunities for the newer council members to, to get in the committee action. So um, at the end of the day, ended up with, with two experienced and two new council members on about every committee, um, had those chaired by previous council members just for quorum and, and operation sakes and uh, tried as best I could to match where council members had shared interest in what committees they wanted to serve on. So just as a quick answer. To now, uh, can't you met at a break if you would, if you need further clarification. Thank you. Council Member Forte. Um, I would just like to say, um, based on what I've heard tonight, and I thank you, I thank you, Susan, and I thank you, Marion. But I, I and I, uh, and without clapping after I get through saying this or booing, whichever you, you all would like to say, this has been very difficult for me. It's been difficult, and it's been difficult for all of us as a city. And I don't want to drag this out, but I'm going to say something because we do have a young man that's on scouts. On Saturday morning, I received a text from my 13 year old granddaughter. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read it, and I'm, hopefully I won't cry, because she saw me on TV several times and not, point, not portrayed in the best light that she knows me. Her name for me is Nani. That's an Italian name for Grandma. And I just want to read this. Hi, Nani. Mom was crying this morning because of the bad things that are happening to you. I looked at... This is for my 13-year-old granddaughter who loves me very much. At the new jerk guy, and I found some interesting info. Now, you have many restrictions, but I don't. Anyways, and then, anyways, I am sorry, so sorry this is happening to you and that your own son doesn't understand that the sales are bad because of his bad sales, not your stealing of sales. And you didn't do anything wrong. And we know that. I'll show you what I found in a second. That doesn't mean to be anything. I just wanted to say that I love you and I support you throughout whatever this may be. I just want this to show, like Susan said, with a, what we portray. Adults may look at it in a different way. Children look at it in a totally different way. And it's very hurtful. It's hurtful to those people that love us. It's hurtful to the, our husbands, our daughters, and the people that are our friends. And when, we're, when we think that they're only supporting us because they do love us, maybe that's okay. But I think there's other reasons they're supporting us too. I just wanted to let you know that that's just very, it, it broke my heart for her but I got to do a very good learning lesson with it. And I got to tell her, these are kind of things that happen, and they're bumps in the road, and you just got to be better after you go over the bump. So I just wanted to read that. And God love McKenna Baldwin because she's just that kind of little girl at 13 years old. So I thank you for letting me just read this to you because it, it's, it's, very hurt, it's very heart sent from her. So thank you. Councilmember Faye? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to to take the time, first of all, to thank Susan for, for coming up and, and making that um, very heartfelt um, message. Um, Marion, I 
thank you for coming up and, and speaking as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, sit down with uh, Marion and Bob this, this week and, and discuss some things and, and uh, several others that um, are in here. Um, I think there's been some positive things that have happened to the council this week. Um, we have opened some lines of communication, at least I feel that we have, um, and we did identify a situation that is policy and practice related. Um, we are going to fix that and we're going to go forward. And Council Member Forte um, put forth a valiant um, effort in, in uh, her, her self-recusal so that we can take a, a, a optimistic look at the situation um, with that. Um, I am confident after looking at emails, after looking at pages and pages of things, and after discussing with many, many, many constituents, and, and, and I appreciate the input, I am confident that we can go forward, and I am confident that we can continue the good work. Because underneath all of this stuff that has been going on, there has been some good work done, but it's been overshadowed been overshadowed by two votes and two votes that caused an incredible separation in this town and an incredible separation between some people that I respect tremendously. I think that we can be better than that. I think that we are better than that. I think that each one up here on the council, as Susan so eloquently put it, and I cannot say it any better, each one up here has a lot to give. And we're up here to fix some problems. We got some serious problems. You know, I sat for the first time on the Public Works Committee this past week. There's some serious stormwater issues to look at. There's some things that economic development, at the end of their meeting the other day, the, uh, the chair, um, Council Member Forte, kind of challenged the, the Public Works Committee, hey, we've got some stormwater issues that we need, to, we need help with. Those are the things that we need to look at. We need to make sure that our police department and our fire department our destination departments, not places to come and get trained and move on. These are the things that make a difference in this city. Yes, we have oaths to uphold, and Councilmember Mosby was quite right. We have oaths to uphold, and we have to look at things that are, but after we've looked at them, we need to move on. We need to look at them, make assessments, and move on and fix those issues. That's what I am confident that's going to happen. And we need to be in a situation where people aren't bickering, where people aren't fighting. We're going to have some healthy debate. Folks, I think that we're supposed to. We're supposed to have healthy debate on philosophical issues on the issues. If there's any questions that ever come up from any of you, I want you to come talk to me. I will open my emails to you. I will open my text to you. I will show you anything that you want to see in regards to my public service. <clears throat> Maybe not some private conversations between my wife and I, though. <laughs> but because she has a whole different expectation of me. <laughs> but, uh, and, 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 you know, there's things happening. There's a whole movement in town on this Pokemon Go thing. Um, my goodness, I didn't know in economic development we had a Pokemon gym. Did I say that right? Right up the road here. But I think we're going to go forward. And I hope, I hope so. 
We need to have unity on the council. And I know that that's everybody's desire up here, whether you, th you think that that was their intent with what they've said or not. I know that's what they want. They want to go forward and solve problems. That's all I got, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll go. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember Moreno. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I want to, uh, first of all, commend the Boy Scout in the room and thank you guys, thank you so much for your service to the community and um, thank everybody for their public comments. I um, also want to thank, uh, specifically thank um, Susan Kaufman for uh, those wonderful words about this council. Um, you know, the last week has been a lot of reflection since last Thursday and uh, I saw a lot of community leaders in the room last Thursday, uh, obviously passionately feeling upset about some issues. Um, the thing that I think is important to stress here, and I actually didn't even want to touch on this topic today, but it's already being touched on. So the thing I want to stress here is that it's important for those when they look at this body and for people on this dais as well uh, to separate first and foremost what happens in journalism or the press from an elected body. This whole process started when I politely and formally asked council, council member or Mayor Pro Tem Benny to consider removing a, co a colleague of mine from liaison to parks. I did do that. The facts obviously presented a situation that warranted that and rightfully so, Council Member Forte stepped away. Right, rightfully so. The problem was, is we spent an entire month with nobody taking the ownership of this issue and just doing the right thing, and it drug on. Unfortunately, because of that, newspaper outlets send in requests. They just sent in a request for a surveillance video in the hallway today. All right? They, they sent in a request. When things like that are brought up and there's controversy, it happens. That's not this body. This body's not in a gotcha politics. This body's not in this business. But what happens is emotions get escalated because of friendships and passion, and rightfully so. I understand it. I understand there's folks in the room, and there's folks in the room last week that are, they're not going to like me. They're never going to like me because of this issue, and that's okay. Okay? But the reality is, is the right thing was done. A request was made for the councilwoman to step away from parks. After four weeks, the councilwoman stepped step away from parks, and I commended her publicly for that. Unfortunately, last week's meeting got extremely intense. And honestly, for my part of it, um, it was unfortunate to see. And quite honestly, for my part of it, I, I hope that we don't have a situation like that again in this body. Um, For those that don't know in the crowd, and I, some of you have seen familiar faces, and obviously Councilwoman Forte's family's here, so I want to say this with the utmost respect, that behind the scenes, when we're in closed session, Councilwoman Forte and I actually are almost on page almost every single time. And we treat each other with the decency and respect that each other deserve behind doors. Unfortunately, this one vote took place out here and it transpired into a very serious, very unfortunate situation. But she has a lot of great ideas behind doors that we often agree on. And that's overshadowed by these one or two votes. And I think that's unfortunate. So I do know that there's something before this body that the, the city manager is going to request. And, I, and I, early on, I talked to, to uh, city manager Arbo about this situation. And I think it's important for this body to take a breather, to take a step back, for the public to take a breather and take a step back, and to let a process play out that hopefully will benefit our city financially and professionally in the future. I, I ask my colleagues, with the utmost respect, that if there is a disagreement on parliamentary procedure, whether it's a motion or a uh, recommendation that we don't get emotional on this dais and that we give each other the accountability that we, we all de deserve and we treat each other with respect. And I think that that was expressed in multiple emails amongst this body um, this week. In fact, I know it was. And 
I think it's important for us to move forward on this to- on on, on uh, onto other business for the city, and I think it's important. F- I'm I'm, a, I'm important for Mr. Mayor. Please, Mr. Mayor. Please, please. So I, I think I think it's important, Mr. Mayor. Sure, go ahead. <clears throat> so I think it's important that the city moves forward, um, and I just ask that uh, that our members of the dais, you know, continue to treat each other with, with respect. This council member, I do believe, Council Member Faith, that we're going to move forward in a positive way. I do believe our city is going to move forward in a positive way. We've learned some lessons from this, all of us involved. I hope. And um, and I and I look forward to serving with everyone on this dais uh, here in the in the near future, including Council Member Forte, uh, and we'll move forward on some important issues. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Council Member Carlisle. Thank you, Mayor. I I just want to say that I'm glad that that those people who have spoken tonight are sorry for the chaos they have caused. Um, I also think it's time for some of these people to stop taking credit for other people's work. The way I see it, we as a council are one body, and the arm can't cut off the leg to make it look better. A council fighting itself does nothing but destroy the body. It's time to move on, do better things, get ready to work for Lee Summit, and think about our future. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to move on because... For those that haven't noticed, it's cold enough to hang meat in this room. (laughs) (laughs) Normally I'm not, but I am tonight. (laughs) Next item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Mr. Mayor, I move for approval of the consent agenda, item 3A. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda, item 3A. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. Well, Council Member Faith, will you please read Bill Number 16-150? Thank you, Mayor. Bill Number 16-150, an ordinance accepting final plat entitled Eagle Creek, 14th Plat, Lots 617-660, in Tract N, as a subdivision to the City of Lee Summit, Missouri. Move for second reading. Second. Moved and seconded to have second reading of Bill Number 16-150. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion <clears throat> passed. Thank you, Council Member. Bill Number 16-150, an ordinance accepting final plat entitled Eagle Creek, 14th Plat, Lots 617-660, and tracked in as a subdivision to the City of Lee Summit, Missouri. Move for adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt Bill Number 16-150. Roll call, please. Councilmember Faith? Aye. Councilmember Seif? Aye. Councilmember Benny? Aye. Councilmember Edson? Aye. Councilmember Forte? Aye. Councilmember Mosby? Aye. Councilmember Carlisle? Aye. Councilmember Marino? Aye. Bill number 16 150 has been approved and becomes ordinance number 7923. Thank you. Councilmember Forte, will you please read Bill number 16 151? Thank you, Mayor. Bill number 16 151, an ordinance approving a preliminary development plan on land located at 120 Southwest M150 Highway in District CP-2 proposed quick trip, all in accordance with the provisions Unified Development Ordinance Number 5209 for the City of Lee Summit, Missouri and repealing Ordinance Number 7914 passed by the Council of the City of Lee Summit, Missouri (coughs) on the seventh day of July 2016, be second read. Second. Moved and seconded. Have second reading of Bill Number 16-151. Uh, Councilman Benny, you had a comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I get somebody <coughs> to confirm that this still is including the South, the Market Street entrance? The motion included both the existing in the new well actually they're both existing market street exits <clears throat> this is the one that that has the uh the condition that left the southern entrance right in right out only open okay. yes thank you sir thank you Mr. Mayor. thank you all, all those in favor aye. aye all those opposed 
Motion passed. Thank you, Council Member. I now move that Bill Number 16-151, an ordinance approving a preliminary development plan on land located at 120 Southwest M150 Highway and District CP2, proposed quick trip all in accordance with the provisions of Unified Development Ordinance Number 5209 for the City of Lee Summit, Missouri, and repealing Ordinance Number 7914, passed by the Council of the City of Lee Summit, Missouri, on the 7th day of July 2016, be adopted. Moved and seconded to adopt Bill Number 16-151. Roll call, please. Councilmember Forte. Aye. Councilmember um, Carlisle. Aye. Councilmember Edson. Aye. Councilmember Faith. Aye. Councilmember Benny. Aye. Councilmember Marino uh, is away from the table. Councilmember Sy. Oh, Councilmember Marino. Aye. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Sive. Aye. Councilmember Mosby. Aye. Bill number 16-151 has been approved and becomes ordinance number 7924. <coughs> Thank you. Councilmember Seif, will you please read bill number 16-152? <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. I'm, I move to recommend to City Council approval of an ordinance authorizing execution sole source agreement with Telvant USA LLC for software support and maintenance of a SCADA OASYS DNA system in the amount of $37,647.44 for the first year and two possible one-year renewal options for the Water Utilities Operation Department. Second. Moved and seconded to have second reading of Bill Number 16-152. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. Council Member? <coughs> I'm, I move uh, for adoption to recommend uh, to the City Council approval of an ordinance authorizing execution sole source agreement of Telvant USA LLC for a software support and maintenance of a SCADA OASYS DNA system in the amount of $37,647.44 for the first year and two possible one year renewal options for the Water Utilities Operations Department. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt Bill Number 16-152. Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, did somebody from the <sighs> Water Department here? What, what? Wes Owen, Assistant Director, of Operations. Thanks, Wes. I, I was just on this. I just wanted to know. Uh, there's, I think, there's five listed items on the procurement practices of of why you could go to a sole source as opposed to bidding. And I was just wondering uh, which one of those this particular uh, vendor fit into, or one or more. Uh, one of the last items on the procurement process policy is a per se sole source, which is awarded to uh, vendors or software manufacturers that develop hardware and software systems that only they know how to operate and put together. So, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, roll call, please. Um, Councilmember Seif. Aye. Councilmember Carlisle. Aye. Councilmember Edson. Aye. Councilmember Faith? Aye. Councilmember Forte? Aye. Councilmember Marino? No. Councilmember Benny? Aye. Councilmember Mosby? Aye. Bill number 16 153 has been approved and becomes, or, I'm sorry, 152 has been approved and becomes ordinance number 7925. Thank you. Councilmember Edson, will you please read bill number 16 153? Thank you, Mayor. I move for second reading, reading an ordinance approving the surety bond deposit agreement guaranteeing installation of subdivision improvements for the Eagle Creek 14th Platt lot 617 through 660 subdivision by and between the city of Lee Summit, Missouri and Hunt Midwest and approving the use of surety bond as security for the installation and construction of said subdivision improvements. Second. Moved and seconded to have second reading of bill number 16-153. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion passed. Thank you, Council Member. I move for approval an ordinance approving the surety bond deposit agreement guaranteeing installation of subdivision improvements for the Eagle Creek 14th Platte, Lot 617 through 660 subdivision by and between the City of Lee Summit, Missouri and Hunt Midwest and approving the use of a surety bond as security for the installation and construction of said subdivision improvements. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt Bill Number 16-153. Roll call, please. Councilmember Edson. Aye. Councilmember Sive. Aye. Councilmember Marino. Aye. Councilmember Benny. Aye. Councilmember Faith. Aye. Councilmember Carlisle. Aye. Councilmember Mosby. Aye. Councilmember Forte. Aye. 
Bill number 16-153 has been approved and becomes ordinance number 7926. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a presentation of the conceptual master development plan for 50 Highway and M291 area associated with the current administrative delay. Mr. McKay. Bob McKay, <clears throat> Director of Planning Codes Administration. Uh, what we're bringing forward this tonight is really a bubble plan to show uh, some of the progress that we've made with the uh, the consultants for the de the uh, development team for Westcott. Uh, we continue to work uh, every week. We meet, uh, we have our discussion, and we're putting these plans together. And so t tonight, uh, this is fairly short, and then we'll take discussion uh, afterwards. <clears throat> As you know, the administrative delay was uh, was put together <coughs> and approved in March, end of March, uh, for a six-month time period, which will run out October 1. Uh, Westcott uh, contractually has to make application for their preliminary development plan for the acreage uh, uh, <clears throat> down south. The administrative delay uh, is, is underway and any applications that come forward would have to come to this body before that time period in order to proceed. The administrative blade boundaries, uh, Pine Tree is the very northern edge all the way down to uh, south of Bailey Road down to 16th Street. Everything that you see there in blue. The reason for the administrative delay primarily was because of the new interchange that's coming in. And this just gives you the improvement design, show you um, um, the diverging diamond that's going to be uh, uh, under construction here shortly. Give you a little bit closer look. As you know, Oldham Parkway, that uh, access point to 291 goes away, uh, turns into uh, Jefferson Street and then eventually uh, there'll be a new uh, new stoplight, new signal that will be, uh, as you can, you can see, I don't know if my cursor's going to allow me to do it. No. <clears throat> anyway, you can see where the, uh, uh, the darker blue area is to the kind of right in the middle. That's where the new interchange will be, the, the new uh, full access. That full access actually gives uh, access both to the Calamar property to the north as well as to the West Cut piece to the south. Key properties that are in the delay area include uh, the West Cut properties, as you well know. Also, uh, the Pfizer, uh, I know that they have a new name. We didn't get the new name on here. <clears throat> the Pine Tree Plaza, what's left of the Odessa property, and the Calamar property. When we met with uh, the Westcott uh, design team, <coughs> what we did was, as a staff, our, our planning staff and, and development center staff, we got together and we, we started listing uh, wishes, that a wish list of what we would like to see on this interchange. It's going to be pretty dynamic, and there's an awful lot of opportunity that's going to be out there. We want to see the it's, it is a gateway to our downtown. Uh, we want it to be a destination point. We want the building uh, community rather than standalone uses. We want mixed uses. We want vertical mixed uses where we have retail, office, and maybe residential in the same building. Residential tied in and integrated with retail and office. Housing choices. The buildings brought close to the street. Prominent architecture. Four sided architecture. Theme look, not all of them have to be identical, but we want to see we're going to have an industrial district, an industrial warehouse type district. We're going to have a entertainment type district, and we're going to have a mixed use district on the Odessa property. So the idea is that each one of them will carry a certain theme throughout. Landscaping would be a, a, a very big part of that. Increase concentrated and long-lasting human activities. We want people to come out here for a particular reason and to stay. Multimodal, pedestrian, bicycle-friendly environment, easily served by transit. Uh, 
with the parking garage, reduced surface on street parking. This one does not have as many parking garages as you saw on the prior road property for obvious reasons. Cost is consideration. Uh, Placemaking uh, and a human scale. Reducing the speed of the motorized uh, vehicle traffic through there. Avoid competition of the same businesses that we already have in Lee Summit. Sustainability uh, that we continue to, uh, to embrace uh, solar, stormwater management, uh, combined with uh, outdoor activities, something that is a, an amenity and not just a holding uh, place for water. Obviously, street trees are a big part of uh, the landscaping element. Sizable public spaces with attractions at strategic locations. We love fountain areas. It draws people. Uh, we love outdoor eating areas. It draws people, and they stay financially workable. Got to be, otherwise it's not going to exist. This was the plan that was in your uh, packets. One minor change to this is you'll see the red dot there that talks about a potential uh, fire station. We moved it basically to uh, where the uh, full access intersection is going to be. Makes sense for the fire to be able to get out where they need to be on a controlled uh, intersection. On this particular plan, what you're going to see is we're going to bring, be bringing back a more detailed and refined plan for you to look at here uh, about the second week of August. As you can see up here uh, where it says the very first full access uh, just to the south of the new interchange, you'll see a pedestrian bridge that goes across there. We actually have taken that and moved that <coughs> further to the north. Our understanding is that with the new interchange improvement, the sidewalk and pedestrian uh, path will come down uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the diverging diamond, <clears throat> but it ends up on the west side where the retail is shown there. With the pedestrian bridge further to the north, that will capture that foot traffic that comes there that can actually go over to the entertainment area and vice versa. Those people on that side can actually get back on the pedestrian trail to get downtown. This is a fairly easy walk into downtown. Um, some of the trail systems are already in place and some are actually being constructed. One of the things that you'll notice uh, in the kind of the, the, the linear green area talks about residential. Um, we want to see more of a mix of the residential and mixed use development closer together so that they can literally walk across the street and, and be into a retail or the commercial environment. Those are things that we'll be bringing back to you on a refined plan uh, next time that you see uh, this, uh, this group come back. These are just some of the sample images that we threw out. Deals with uh, the types of uses, uh, uh, places where you, uh, People places, places to congregate, uh, disregard the cars in the middle. That's something that we want to try to avoid. We want to create uh, areas for pedestrians to be able to walk around, congregate, eat, and uh, recreate. And again, these are, these are sample images. These are things that... Um, uh, the ULI, Urban Land Institute, uh, does a great job in putting together a variety of, of, uh, of development patterns. This possibly could be, uh, could be a hotel either on the east side or the west side of this interchange. A lot of these have the mixed-use environment with the retail and the office on the ground <coughs> floor and residential above. <coughs> uh, 
I think the uh, the scale of these buildings would fit very comfortably in the location around this interchange. This is uh, <clears throat> something that very similar to what we had seen uh, in at Marco Island, where they had created a. Uh, uh, a group of restaurants around a variety of, of um, fountains, and it, it drew people, and they were out there uh, visiting around that fountain, and I thought that would work here, something that draws people in and, and keeps them here. I don't get too excited about this. This is really more of a, uh, a downtown urban type setting, but if you could uh, take this and you could scale this down a little bit, this is the kind of stuff that we're looking for. Bring people in, build it, and they will come. Create an atmosphere that, that is exciting for people to be here and want to stay here. Actually want to live here, recreate here, and come back. So, with that said, here's a, a kind of the timeline that we're on right now. Obviously, tonight uh, I'm giving you uh, just a quick uh, bubble plan. On August 11th, we'll bring back a refined conceptual plan that the city will actually bring back to you. And then on 818, <clears throat> there'll be a joint request by the city as well as the developer to make application for um, per the administrative delay. Remember the administrative delay, any, any application has to come before you in order for it to proceed ahead. And so we'll be making a joint uh, a request to proceed with an application, leaving the administrative delay in place. And then the very next day, we will actually, the city initiated rezoning application will come to you with a conceptual plan as well as some conceptual design standards. <clears throat> at that time, uh, <clears throat> we'll be looking at Rezoning everything that you saw in that in that one slide that that showed where the administrative delay area is We would look at rezoning all that property to plan mixed use and Then what that does is that that sets the uh, The time frame then for the Planning Commission to go ahead and hold their public hearing obviously that comes on to you while we're in doing that process the developer can then submit for their preliminary development plan based on that conceptual plan that we've actually put in front of you and you've been able to uh, to to adopt the conceptual plan along with the rezoning <clears throat> and then they come in and make their preliminary development plan uh, request or their application at that time. Application uh, they would submit on uh, September 1 or or before. Um, what you're seeing in red there is actually what the city is responsible for. Our planning commission then would, would have our public hearing on our PMIX zoning and the conceptual plan. If you go down to the very bottom, uh, then the city council would uh, review uh, that public hearing on October 6th. 9-15-16, we would be coming in to request a 30-day extension on the administrative delay that would take it from uh, October 1 to November 1. <coughs> that basically gives the 30-day opportunity for the preliminary development plan to fully proceed through the process uh, for the developer. Uh, these are both uh, developer uh, uh, dates. October 25th, the Planning Commission would have, have their public hearing, and then City Council would get it on uh, November 17th. And with that, uh, that that is pretty much. I just wanted to have an opportunity to show you where we're at up to this point. We have been working with uh, with this group for some time, and I thought it would be nice just to give you an update as to where we're at. We'll be bringing back, uh, like I said, we'll, the refined uh, uh, here in a couple of weeks. We'll actually have uh, some buildings located on it, and uh, it'll be more detail. Questions? Questions? Councilmember Seif. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, one, what is the rationale for not having this go to the CEDC? Um, it was the council direction 
towards staff to bring back a <clears throat> a master development plan. So it will never go to the CEDC for discussion? Um, I guess that would be certainly up to you to, to do so. I understand we're on a quick timeline, but I... If that if that's a desire of the council, we could we could build that into this process. I, and I'm sure that you know if we're ready to go, uh, we could probably bring something back. Mayor Rhodes, I think probably September, if I may. This is a kind of like a zoning issue. So um, CDC is a great location for our economic tools and economic development. Uh, in those, uh, I know they've been working on tar target areas for economic development uh, but there's a time I guess really we thought that once they've set that framework for us CEDC has in the City Council they set that framework of what they wanted to have happen so we were just using the the normal process for planning established by the state statutes of going through the Planning Commission and then having the Planning Commission make its recommendation to the full City Council is the the typical process but and, and typical is probably not a very because we do so few of these, I don't know if we really have a procedure that we follow, I, I suppose. It's a, you know, we consider it a zoning issue, and the zoning issue is, I think, regulated pretty much by state statute. Not that you can't put extra steps in to your, your process if that's what you desire. Uh, just one additional question. Um, I noticed that you have two gateway monuments. Is that an either or, or are there actually going to be two there? They were both shown as a possibility. Um, they could be either or. One thought that we actually had was that if we end up doing a pedestrian bridge across 291, there's an opportunity there to do a gateway monument on that structure itself that would be visible to a whole lot of people traveling that, that corridor. <clears throat> so there may be an opportunity for one or the other, and there also the pedestrian bridge and I understand you know the the idea that we vetted a lot of this information before but I, I still question why it wouldn't go to CEDC for a discussion in more detail but uh, yeah there's some other lights we may they may want to address that councilor Benny thank you mr. Mayor. mr. McKay you have a uh, fire station location in here how did you come to determine where to put that I'm sorry, what was your question? How did you determine where you put the red dot? How did we determine it? We were <clears throat> Basically, it was uh, we knew that we needed one down in that area, and this is the logical place for access right on to Bailey Road. Help, help, me, not, help me, why do you why do you know you need a red dot there? Did you use the standard of coverage document? Is it is it showing that there's a, a blank circle in there somewhere that we need a new station? That just it came up in our discussions that do we need another fire station down in this area? The answer was yes, it, it would be very helpful to have one with this kind of development here. Uh, so this is where this is where it got placed. So is this a new station or a replacement to an existing station? Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Osterman, Osterman may be able to help you. He's our Brian Osterman, Assistant Chief Fire Department. And the standards of cover work that we did through accreditation uh, lists a series of different recommendations and time frames. This is one of five that's listed in the long-term recommendations, the five to ten year plan. Uh, four of the recommendations deal with staffing locate or I'm sorry, station locations, additional staffing at those at those stations. Uh, the fifth one deals with staffing that we have currently. This is listed, I believe, number two uh, in that long-term recommendations through the standard of cover. The problem is the, the benchmark times that we have in this area are very hard to get to at this time, especially with all the new constructions that's going to go on and the, and the continued you know, issues we have getting to that area. Uh, this was part of that recommendation through standards of cover. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. McKay, the, uh, did we, is there a re we stopped at 16th and didn't quite go down to Thompson, and I know there's some lots and stuff and there's a reason we didn't just go down to Thompson while we were there Are we saving that for later 
No, I think that <clears throat> getting down to 16th Street, that also gave us uh, access to Decker. D 16th Street is going to be a, uh, um, it's not going to be a full access at some point. And we have to go down to Thompson in order to get there, and we use Decker to get uh, to get down there to that. So we stopped at 16th Street. All right, and then I know stormwater is one of the major issues that's inhibited development through this area. So does this plan take into account, when you've laid this out, does it take into account what you're going to have to do to deal with stormwater, or is that something that's going to come later? Stormwater will be dealt with as, as well as uh, sanitary sewer. And, uh, and water, all the infrastructure has to be dealt with in this, uh, in this plan. But in this case, we're just dealing with the zoning at this time. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Marino. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. McKay, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple quick questions. Uh, in relation, now we, we have the gateway monuments. Are those the monuments that we see, like on, you're referencing like on 470 and View High and Chipman Road and 50 Highway? I don't think that that's been determined yet. Uh, they, they certainly could be an element of that. Okay. Um, that, that like I said, that uh, they were placeholders at this point, but I would imagine that uh, gateway monuments would reflect the same architectural design that we're placing in other places of town. And would we be using the same individual, or would we, or would we be bidding these out, or who would be designing these gateway monuments? Oh, that that's not determined at this point. Okay. And then, um, and then the other question I have is um, in relation to the design that you have, you mentioned at one point you said this is a scaled-down version we would do a scaled down version of the picture that you showed. Um, was that in the public space community plaza area? Um, right, go that one right there. Yeah. Would something like that be right there on the public space community plaza section that you have? <clears throat> it'd be, uh, it'd be in the entertainment, uh, area. Okay. Um, if you scale this down, you took the cars away from here. And you created a uh, a very walkable environment. That's what we're looking at here. I got what you because that, that was going to be my question was what did you mean by scaled down? So you, what you're meaning is not having the thoroughfare kind of car traffic through the middle of it like you have like this is in this picture. Right, and the buildings would probably be scaled back as well. I mean, I don't see these kind of buildings uh, necessarily. You might have one of these buildings. I don't know. If you'd have this this amount. Yeah. Okay, can we go back to the design picture real quick? Now, um, the Odessa property, which we have marked retail, and the property where your public space and community plaza is, mixed use area, um, what we're doing here, because my understanding is we don't have a, it, those slots are still essentially on the market in some ways, right? I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. When we were when we were discussing the Westcott development plan, we talked about the front side, the front pro uh, property area uh, along 50 Highway uh, to the um, what is that the east of 291? Right. And we talked about the Odessa side on the other side of the highway, right. <clears throat> and there was discussion about potentially that individual or DD Construction or whoever, you know, Westcott Development or whoever, um, purchasing one of those properties or both of those properties to, to do a addition number two or whatever. Um, is that still the case, or do we have other individuals that own those properties at this time? At this particular time, what we're doing is we're setting out a, a master plan of our desire. <clears throat> um, we don't have anybody right now. Um, I know that there are there, there's activity going on uh, with Odessa and with Calmar, <clears throat> but as far as I know, we don't have a developer for either one of those properties as of yet. Mm -hmm. So we will be, <clears throat> basically that's why we're doing the bubble plan and the con a concept plan, mm -hmm. was once we get the zoning done and we get a concept plan in, then whoever comes in, whatever developer would come through the door, we would at least have a skeleton of a plan for them to start working with us 
to develop. And obviously they would have to come back through the planning, uh, through the uh, city council to get any kind of changes to that plan. But this would help us to set out the traffic corridors through there, mm -hmm. um, ideas put in place of where parking garage needs to be in the best location and what it's going to be serving. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing now. Okay. Um, and I, thank you so much for the answer because that was going to be my next question. So, and then um, my final question I have for you is where we have retail and mixed, vertical mixed use uh, on the um, north, uh, what is that, the just west side, just right there at Bailey, um, right across the Jefferson from Abundant Life. Uh -huh. um, what would happen with the current, would retail be categorized to what's currently there, or is this going to be a new retail uh, facility? <clears throat> this plan envisions all all new facility. This okay. this is this is a kind of a global plan, <clears throat> uh, and it, I'm sure it'd be done in increments. Uh, but yes, it would be all new construction. Okay, I just ask because we have a, like that little area has kind of a hodgepodge. Like they have a car wash, but then they have right. uh, like a retail. I guess you can call it a retail store in some ways. You know. Um, uh, con uh, consignment shop and some things. So I wasn't sure if that would if that meant that we were going to keep the same building structure. If there was going to be new structures there. No, and a lot of that's going to be impacted by uh, the new interchange and the uh, uh, the roadways in and around that area. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Oh, sorry. Councilmember Mosby. Thank you, Mayor uh, Bob. I mean, I appreciate you. You guys doing that? It, it looks kind of like one we saw recently in another area. I was just uh, kind of curious. I do remember the uh, downtown overlay went through the, what used to be the Economic Development Committee, and then it transformed to CEDC Committee. And the uh, M150 overlay went through the CEDC Committee. And I was just looking at the definition of the the scope of the committee: reviews current and proposed policies or ordinance. It says dealing generally with planning, zoning, residential, commercial development, blah, 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 blah. And, and the reason why I bring that up is, you know, we're already starting to micromanage this. Do you really want to bring it back to the full council and then there's eight people picking at it? Wouldn't it be better to go to a committee that can do a good, diligent job of helping you refine it on behalf of the whole council? I mean, that's what they're there for. And then bring it back to, to the full council. It'd be a lot smoother. It really doesn't take any more time. Uh, and just We know how we act and the way we do things. It just seems to be a lot smoother. And that is traditionally the way we've done things. Uh, yeah, or they can send it from there. We, often we've sent it from CDC to the Planning Commission. We, we could certainly do that. Uh, when we were given the direction to to bring this back, we understood that we had a, a defined timeline in which the developer had to uh, make application. And so we backed the timeline up, and that's what you're seeing in front of you today. Um, if we want to push down and uh, put the CEDC in there, that, that's not problematic. It's just, uh, it's just additional time. Well, it actually wouldn't appear to because rather than come here, it would go to CEDC and then go to planning commission so that really wouldn't add a step it would remove us from that initial part you're, say, you're saying do that in in lieu of coming back coming back to, to, to us I mean, it just it seems to make sense and they can do the heavy lifting and that's what they're designed to do and, and we got some good personnel on there so uh they can work on it pretty good and, and uh yeah, get I, a good I, product going forward and then when it comes to us it's pretty much polished and ready to go would be the theory just like the other things we've done in the past. Yeah, if that's the direction, uh, we'd be, we certainly could do that. We would ask for consensus, but we kind of have some of the council members missing some. <laughs> We're missing well, some. Well, I have some questions, Mayor. So that was... <laughs> uh, for those that are here, does that cause any harm? I mean, we can do consensus. We have to, I mean, we have to proceed even if people are missing. Okay. Uh, I, I think there's consensus to take it to CEDC. Just kind of getting head nods. Yeah, just yeah. be basically we'll take where it says city council, we'll replace that with okay. CEDC. Yeah. And then eventually the uh, the recommendation from the planning commission will come back to the full city council. Yeah, that would so, make sense. That's great. Okay. Anything else? I have no further lights, so thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank you.
Next item on the agenda is an overview and status report of the Summit Place Development and TIF project. Good evening. My name is David Bushak. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Gilmore and Bell. I am going to provide um, a brief summary of um, some items that are associated with the next two ordinances that are on your agenda under item number six. The, uh, the Summit Fair TIF plan was approved on August 24th of 2006. Uh, it's actually called the Lee Summit East Tax Increment Financing Plan, but it was for uh, initially the Summit Fair project. Then in May of 2014, the council approved the first amendment to that TIF plan for the Summit Place project. So there's one TIF plan that covers both the Summit Fair project that's been constructed and then the Summit Place project that is to be constructed. The Summit Place project, as that amendment was processed by um, and approved by the City Council in 2014, um, has a approximately $73 million budget. The TIF reimbursement is about $11.7 million, and the CID reimbursement through an additional one cent sales tax is about $6.8 million. So both of those projects are in the same TIF plan. Uh, there's one common redevelopment area, but they are separate shopping centers. They have separate budgets. Uh, and then in August of 2014, the city executed uh, the contract with the developer for the Summit Place project. Uh, so one distinction uh, under the TIF law that we've discussed in connection with previous projects, there's the redevelopment area, which is the entire area of the entire TIF plan, and then there are project areas. The project areas are where TIF is activated. Uh, we've discussed the 23-year clock that's associated with TIF collection. That applies within each distinct project area. So all of that is relevant for one particular reason that we're facing now, and that is the rule in the TIF Act that provides that all TIF projects have to be approved within 10 years after the plan is approved. So the date that I first mentioned, August 24, 2006, will reach the 10-year deadline next month, August 24 uh, of this year. So that means we're up against this 10-year rule now. Uh, the two projects that are needed to be activated for the Summit Place uh, TIF plan need to be approved by the council before August 23rd of this year, um, or the city will lose the ability to activate those TIF projects. Uh, this, is an, this is an absolute deadline. The statute is clear on this issue. There's no way to, to have an extension of that. There's no, there's no place to appeal for an extension, for an example. So the 10-year uh, deadline is absolute, and if the project ordinances aren't approved before then, um, then TIF can't be used for that project. That concludes my summary as the background for uh, why these two items are on the agenda tonight. And we've asked the developer to give you a short summary of the status of the project so you understand where things stand right now from the developer standpoint. Good evening, Jeff Haney, uh, Red Development, 7500 College Boulevard, Suite 750, Overland Park, Kansas, 66210. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, thank you for uh, taking time to hear us tonight. And uh, uh, I think David did a nice job of the technical issues that we're dealing with as long as, as the second reading of this ordinance that was pr approved when we approved the TIF plan. And uh, this second reading for us is usually a very exciting point because this means we're getting ready to, to move forward. Uh, we wouldn't do this if the project wasn't ready. Uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit earlier. Uh, we actually plan to break ground in November on the project, so sometimes you would wait right up to that date to do that, but because of this 10-year uh, window, time flies, uh, we're here tonight to try to do that and activate that and ask for your support. Um, I have some overheads if we want to look at those, but I think everyone's really familiar with the projects that we have in place. Uh, Summit Place we've worked on since I have since 2000, 2011, uh, the preliminary development plan. Um, I could slip that on there if that would be helpful. My plan might be a little bit bigger. <coughs> Zoom it up. Yeah. Great. 
So I think this is the plan we always use, and you guys have seen numerous times at the whole uh, intersection of 470 and 50 with uh, Summit Woods, our initial project uh, done in 2002. Summit Fair was opened in 2009. Uh, tech centers here, and then the white site plan there is the Summit Place project, and that's the one we're here to activate tonight. And like I said, we uh, approved the PDP for that was approved in 2011. Uh, 2014, we uh, approved uh, the TIF plan at City Council. Also, the uh, PDP was approved at City Council for the Summit Place at that time in 2014 as well. Uh, two weeks ago, we submitted the final development plan for the anchor tenant, uh, which I would love to still tell you exactly who that is, but we're being that's up to them to divulge that. I think we're a uh, very short period away from doing that. Uh, things are going very well with them. Uh, we plan to start construction, as I said, in November. Uh, they would plan to open in September of October of uh, 2017. We've had a number of other tenants that uh, we're working with. That the demand is there. The timing of it uh, is, you know, we're we're right at that point where I think we'll be able to uh, get everything done. The first phase, like I said, open in fall of 17. I think the second tenants would uh, be in the first quarter, second quarter of 2018, and that would be the full build out of the project. So. Uh, you know, we've been very excited. Steve Rich is here with us tonight with Townsend uh, Capital, uh, and uh, we've really enjoyed working with them as their JV partner on this project, also working with them on the Summit Orchard. And, you know, when we started on this plan and this project, a lot of the area you see uh, in, in gray here all the way around, that was a bunch of grass. We weren't sure what that was going to be. Uh, Steve's done a great job with uh, Innovation Campus, a hotel, <coughs> additional uses there. So. Our goal of trying to, you know, create a, a greater hub for this whole area is, is uh, I think, uh, coming together, and we're excited about that. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, we're here to ask for the uh, approval of the second reading to activate the TIF uh, TIF area for Summit Place projects. Any questions? Councilor Arbeni. Thank you. So, Mr. Haney, we're not going to get announcements tonight. I heard you say, but possibly very soon. Yes, sir. I did. Uh, I think some people, uh, not on this project, but we were pleased to announce H and M is uh, coming to uh, Summit Fair uh, this week. So we're hoping to start construction on that too in the next uh, August eighth. Is actually when we're trying to get that done, but not quite there with this. Uh, very close, uh, close enough that there's. Uh, you know, we like I said, we've uh, submitted the final development plan, so it has everything but the names on the buildings. Very good. Um, and who that tenant, that tenant would be. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Marino. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, now, this design here, is this the current or is this going to be, or is this future? When, when you're talking about like Summit Fair, it says JCPenney, Macy's, Victoria's Secret, Loft, et cetera. Is this future businesses coming in and current businesses or is this just current businesses? Now, the, the boxes here, that's Summit Fair. Those are current businesses. Okay. And that's where uh, H&M is going to go right in this location. And then the Dick Sporting Goods that we were in here uh, not too long ago. Yeah. would also go in that general area. That was, so, was going to be my next question because I noticed the Dick's isn't on that list. And so, right. They're not on there yet because we haven't started construction. Okay. Um, now, Summit Place, mm -hmm. um, we, there was obviously some news about uh, Cabela's mm -hmm. coming and there's been information kind of back and forth and since in the press. Um, so is that what we're talking about in terms of an anchor client and getting potentially some, some news on other than them? Uh, no, there's another tenant. The, the larger tenant in the middle is the one that we consider we've been calling the anchor since we've been working on that. Cabela's, we have been working with them. We're happy to be uh, pretty far down the road with them. They did discover an issue that uh, was in the paper with the yep. radius restriction on the speedway. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking with them about it. Uh, and I would say that uh, my communication, my knowledge of it, and what uh, the last article in the newspaper where the uh, mayor of the unified government said, yes, there's an issue here, we're studying it, but we feel it's something that can be resolved. And, and I think that's a very fair statement. And that's what uh, it needs to be resolved. Cabela's understands that. We do too. And uh, I think all the parties have, are comfortable that we'll be able to do that. So we do have some positive dialogue going on because I get questions. I think everybody on this dais probably gets questions about Cabela's and right. that area. Um, so we do have some positive dialogue happening. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, I don't have any further questions, Mayor. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Further questions? Very good. So what we need to do tonight is have the reading of these next two, uh, the two ordinances. Okay. 
Yeah, Councilor, now we have had first reading and these were done back in Mar uh, May of 2014. So all we need this evening is the second reading, which we motion to approve. Councilor Benny, will you please read bill number 14-29? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bill number 14-29, an ordinance approving redevelopment project 2A for the Lease Summit East amended and restated tax increment financing plan as amended by the First Amendment and activating the collection of tax in increment financing revenues therein move for adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt bill number 14-29. Roll call, please. Councilmember Benny? Aye. Councilmember Carlisle? Aye. Councilmember Edson? Aye. Councilmember Faith? Aye. Councilmember Marino? Aye. Uh, Councilmember Mosby? Aye. Councilmember Seif? Aye. Councilmember Forte is away from the table. Bill number 14-29 has been approved and becomes ordinance number 7927. Thank you. And like the previous bill, Councilmember Carlisle, will you please have second reading of bill number 14-30. Thank you, Mayor. Bill number 14-30, an ordinance approving redevelopment project 2B for the lease amendment east amended and reinstated tax increment financing plan as amended by the first amendment and activating the collection of tax increment financing revenues therein be adopted. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt bill number 14-30. Roll call, please. Councilmember Carlisle? Aye. Councilmember Seif? Aye. Councilmember Edson? Aye. Councilmember Faith? Aye. Councilmember Marino? Aye. Councilmember Mosby? Aye. Councilmember Benny? Aye. Councilmember Forte is away from the table. Bill number 14-30 has been approved and becomes ordinance number 7928. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a presentation on the out-of-state motor vehicle sales tax. If I could have the overhead. Good evening, Conrad Lamb, Finance Director. This, most of the council is aware <clears throat> that on August 2nd, there will be an election and the city will have two items on the ballot. Uh, <clears throat> the, the question will be to ask whether or not we should discontinue the collection of the city's sales tax on motor vehicles, <clears throat> trailers, boats, outboard motors purchased from dealers outside the state of Missouri. <clears throat> in 2012, the Supreme Court held a, or upheld a case that found that if a community did not have a, sale, a use tax that and a <clears throat> boat trailer was purchased out of state, then the local sales tax did not apply to the titling of that particular vehicle or trailer. Lee Summit does not have a use tax, uh, and in this case, uh, the community was Springfield. They did not have a use tax, uh, <clears throat> and they found that, therefore, the tax did not apply, the local portion. In 2013, the state legislature actually created a fix for that uh, because this tax has been collected ever since the state of Missouri uh, started applying uh, sales tax. Uh, but in that legislation, it required that we have a vote. And that vote needed to occur before November 2016. Uh, <clears throat> this last legislative session, they actually extended the date for that until 2018. But our council placed this uh, or sent this to the election commission earlier this year before the new legislation was complete. <clears throat> so, how does the tax apply to us here in Lee Summit? The, um, <clears throat> it is only going to apply if you go to Kansas or some other state and purchase <clears throat> one of these items. 
Um, if you continue to buy from the local dealerships in Lee Summit or even the adjoining communities, if it's in Missouri, then that tax is going to apply. The other thing is, is this a new tax? And absolutely not. As I mentioned, <clears throat> this tax is applied to titling of motor vehicles boats and trailers since sales tax uh, began in the state of Missouri. Probably the most significant thing <clears throat> is the fact that this will have an impact on local dealerships. Um, there are several dealerships in Lee Summit, uh, not to mention the entire state, that have invested millions of dollars in their dealerships, they employ a lot of people. Um, and if this tax was to be discontinued, as the actual ballot language reads, then you could go and purchase, you could compare vehicles at a local dealership and go to another community in, say, Lenexa, Kansas, buy the exact same vehicle and save anywhere from $500 to $1,000. That would put our local dealerships at a competitive disadvantage. <clears throat> there have been, so far, uh, the April election had over 100 communities that voted this, and over 100 of them passed. I believe there were actually two that might have failed. On the August primary, we uh, will have our election, as will independents. Raytown, Greenwood, and Blue Springs. So, the actual ballot language, this is, there we go, I think I got it. <clears throat> this is the actual language that will be on the ballot. Shall the city of Lee Summit, Missouri, discontinue applying and collecting the local sales tax on the titling of motor vehicles, trailers, boats, outboard motors that were purchased from a source other than a Missouri uh, licensed Missouri dealer. So discontinue the collection from someone other than a Missouri dealer. <clears throat> Fortunately, the, line, this, the paragraph below it actually helps to explain what a yes vote means. Uh, approval of this would result in reduction of local revenue to, uh, that provides for our basic services. In Lee Summit, for the 2015 fiscal year, there were $193 million worth of vehicles that were titled in our community. We have a 2.25% sales tax. That's broken down by four individual components. The so one cent general, which is money that we use for our basic city services, public safety, public works. We have the half cent transportation sales tax, which we use almost exclusively for road maintenance. Uh, probably the largest item is the overlay and the slurry seal. We also have a half cent road capital improvement sales tax, and that is voted uh, or has been voted every 10 years w for a specific set of projects. And then lastly, we have the half or the quarter cent parks and soils tax, uh, which happens to also be uh, on the ballot for uh, August 2nd as well. So this is a little example here. Um, if you take, and, and we did this uh, a very scientific study to determine how much of the tax we might lose um, if vehicles were purchased outside of Missouri. Actually, Missouri Municipal League also did it, and we somewhat confirmed that by going to the parking lot and counting the vehicles that had Kansas dealership names on them versus Missouri dealerships. And we're at the point of almost 20% of that $193 million worth of vehicles being purchased from dealerships outside of Missouri. Today, the, the tax generates $4.4 .4 million, all four taxes combined. <clears throat> if you break it down into that 20%, uh, 
we would lose anywhere, again, depending on a range, up to $880,000 a year. And that's split out between the four different taxes. So on August 2nd, if you vote no, that will allow the continuation of the collection of the tax as we have done ever since we voted our first sales tax in Lee Summit. If you vote yes, it will eliminate uh, that tax, and then obviously uh, the city would have to adjust accordingly. That, any questions? Questions, Councilmember Edson? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have any questions about the tax. I was just wondering collectively how many times staff has given this presentation. I'd say kind of off the top of my head, probably about 20 to 25 times, you think? Collectively. Yeah, yeah. collectively. Sure. I just want to say thank you for all your oh. time and effort in doing that. I know I've, I don't have any questions because I've heard it <laughs> at least four <laughs> times and twice today. So thank you. You know, I might say we've worked really hard uh, to be as neutral as possible. We are, ju we are just to give information. We're not actually advocating uh, one vote one way or the other. That's not the role that we should play. So uh, both Conrad and I have worked hard on um, being neutral. So. Councilmember Benny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate staff's neutrality and role as an information provider solely. It's our choice as elected officials if we choose to speak on behalf or against an issue. If we choose, we've got roundtable for that. But um, Conrad, help me so this could, um, without the ability to collect that tax, our automobile, dealer, automobile dealers could be at a real competitive disadvantage. In other words, um, uh, being in a metropolitan area along a boundary, somebody could go somewhere nearby that didn't, that wasn't, if we weren't able to continue collecting this and save, what did you say, an average of 500 to 1,000? I used an example of a... $20,000 vehicle times our two and a quarter, that's $450. So you can gauge it <clears throat> up or down based on the price of a vehicle, but it's that easy that just by going across the state line, um, you could save that amount of money. And it's, and again, it's not just cars, it's for boats, trailers, uh, every all those items that are defined in the statute and this this town has had a, a, a great transformation and it's not just Don Cahan and Dave Cross and Bob side anymore I, I two dozen three dozen car dealerships in town I the the times that I've done this I I've caught myself and I wish I had the number but just in the last 10 years we've had the dealerships that have gone up uh, on Oldham, Parkway, and Colburn. There's probably close to 10 just on those two uh, roads. So it's, I'd call it a pretty important sector then to our economic stability. And each time they, <clears throat> they are multi-million dollar uh, buildings that they're constructing. With a, a large amount of employees as well. Right. I don't think you put one of those up without 50 or right. 100 people for permanent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Syke. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would assume there will be banners going up for educational purposes on this issue as well. I'll let Steve. <clears throat> we, uh, we're we doing a, a, a mailer, uh, pretty much like what you see here that's going to the households. Uh, we also been advised, uh, we're not coordinating or participating in this, but we've also been advised that the car dealership uh, group is doing advocacy information uh, in the next few weeks. So, um, but this is basically, I think, what we're providing uh, our citizens through a, ma a mailing situation. So, thank you, Councilor Marino. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Can you elaborate a little bit on how, it, uh, if this tax goes away, our dealerships will be at a competitive disadvantage? A consumer. A purchaser of a vehicle um, could go to Kansas and therefore uh, right off the top save that amount of money which places 
our local dealerships, they would. Um, well, I've heard you say that. You've said that a couple times. But how are they saving that kind of money? Let, Do, let, me, it, let me take a shot at it. Okay. So sometime. Um, so when you uh, buy a new car and then you got to get your um, tag and your, your license, so you go, sometimes we go to the Department of Motor Vehicle, and um, they're going to ask you where you live. They're going to need to look at your driver's license or they're going to say, what is your home address? They're going to put that in the computer and then it's going to tell them what the sales tax is for where you live. It's not where you buy the car, but it's where you live is where right. the sales tax applies. Well, if this doesn't get uh, renewed, what they will say is um, the two and a quarter percent uh, city sales tax no, doesn't apply because you bought this car in Olathe, Kansas, instead of the state of Missouri. So you could save when you get your car licensed and you have to pay that god awful sales tax that you kind of forget about when, you, when you're negotiating your car price. Um, you could save money on your sales tax on your car uh, when you get it registered by two and a half, two and a quarter percent. Okay, but are other counties, how is that, my question is this, and I completely understand why, why the city, you know, is concerned about this. There's no doubt the numbers are daunting when you talk about $880,000 in city revenue and, and how important the vehicle sector is. So I want to cl clarify this in saying it's really important that we protect or at least we, we have that Continue. sector in this community, right? But I guess for the listeners listening, because this is the question that I hear out there when people ask me, is we continue to hear that they're going to save money, but if this tax goes away, then how are they at a disadvantage if they're not paying? Are they saving the tax then when they go to Kansas? That's right. They're not paying the tax if they go to Kansas. Okay. That's right. If this goes away. If it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. It, okay. Yep. Right now, uh, it's a level playing field. So you buy a car in Kansas, you come here, you get it. Uh, they look at your um, your residency where you live, and they just they go ahead and, and put the full sales tax on it, regardless of where you buy it. But if this goes away, then only um, things that are purchased in the state of Missouri, vehicles that are purchased in the state of Missouri, would have the full tax. Anything purchased outside the state of Missouri, you'd save two and a quarter percent on your sales tax. And does Kansas? have this those, does kansas have the same requirement on folks that come over here and buy buy their vehicles the sales tax laws in missouri and kansas <clears throat> are quite different actually kansas <clears throat> and again in missouri uh most people are associated with retail sales you pay the sales tax point of sale most places are point of sale right in missouri for vehicles it's where it's titled. So that's what separates us from Kansas in the sales tax collection. Okay. Um, and I appreciate that because I, I think hopefully that I didn't make it even worse and make it maybe more confused. But I think it's important to have that kind of information because we keep hearing at a competitive disadvantage, but no one really understands why they're at a competitive disadvantage. And so I think that's going to be really important. I do want to say this one point and this one comment that I think that on one hand we have a, we, we really have to be concerned about the daunting amount of revenue the city would lose if this goes. But on the other hand, we also have to be kind of delicate, I think, as a city. And so I appreciate City Manager Arbo's comments. We have to be delicate in the, in the appearance of us campaigning for a tax. Um, we see these banners on our parks department, our parks areas. We're, you're saying homeowners are going to get a mailer in the mail. You know, I mean... I understand it's for information purposes, but I think that we have to be very delicate on the the aggressiveness we're going uh, because it could potentially backfire, is my concern. If, if I'm Joe Public and I get a letter in the mail telling me about a tax, my concern is why is the government telling me about a, about a tax? You know, and so I'm worried that there's going to be a sector that's going to go out and say, I don't want the government telling me you know, doing a pitch to me about a tax, I'm worried that's going to backfire. And so I just would caution us on how delicate we are, because I can tell you in terms of these banners, I'm, I've probably had six different people in the last week mention it to me. And I'm a little concerned about um, when I see this, I talk here about the mailboxes, I'm concerned about the impact that that could have. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Faith. Just one question, Conrad. Could you um, 
go over the city services that are affected by <clears throat> by this again. I, I know that it said road services and 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 this particular document. Um, They're all it, lumped it together. It's not. It's kind of lumped together, and it's <clears throat> not really in our our packet broken out or anything like that. So, okay. could, if you could go over the city services that are all affected. Right. The, the other thing I'll point out, all four of the sales taxes were voted and approved by the people of Lee Summit at one point in time. <clears throat> so the one cent, which is what we refer to as the one cent general, it's a general purpose sales tax. That money uh, actually makes up 25 percent of the general fund's total revenues. Now, that's not just motor vehicles. That's Sales tax is what we call one of our big three, <clears throat> and that is uh, provides the funding for our public safety, public works, uh, basic city services. It goes into our general fund. The half cent transportation is a totally separate fund, and it goes to pay for almost exclusively the overlay uh, curb replacement, some curb replacement, and uh, slurry seal, and basic road maintenance. Then the third one is the half cent road and bridge, uh, what we around here have referred to as the 10-year road plan. Uh, the best example is the Bailey Bridge that just opened, was paid for uh, under our road and bridge capital improvement sales tax, and then parks and soils, which is also on the ballot uh, August 2nd and just as a point just as a point we are as stated before some of the city business that's at hand we are really trying to we need to get in and fix some of these public works issues and uh, we definitely want to make sure that our public safety stays strong right. so <clears throat> thank you thank you Conrad uh, the next item on the agenda is committee reports. Any committee reports this evening? Councilmember Forte. We had our first CEDC meeting this last week, um, and our next one will be on the 10th of, of August. We're going to have our first communication ad hoc meeting on August 8th, August 8th at 4 o'clock. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Faith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we had a, a Tuesday, July 19th at 3 p.m. There was a public safety advisory board meeting at the uh, police department. Uh, fantastic uh, attendance and, and uh, some great things discussed, reports uh, from the fire department and the police department. Um, I just want to mention specifically one um, that, you know, our police department and fire department do outstanding work every day. And we don't hear about a lot of the emergencies because they're doing their job. And that's, that's we have to keep that in mind. Um, one particular um, call that, that caught my attention this, this week was a, a structure fire. And it was called in, and, and when it was called in on 911, the operators, um, the 911 operators, did not have a, someone speaking to them on the other end of the phone. And uh, they, they just heard um, smoke alarms going off. Now, a lot of times we think about the folks that are, are responding um, personally to these emergencies, and, and they truly are heroes. But truly the first response starts with that 911 operator. And uh, we certainly appreciate what our, our dispatchers do, our 911 dispatchers do, and how they absolutely are the first step to protecting the public. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Roundtable. Any Council Roundtable this evening? Council Member Benning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would, uh, I'll make my public safety announcement. Please stay off the train tracks. The uh, Pokemon craze is... Uh, causing a lot of people to wander around the parks and uh, please 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 be careful and remember that trains are dangerous and you don't always hear them coming so please be careful on the train tracks um, I'd like to thank uh, Chief Forbes and uh, his guys in blue and Councilmember Forte we were uh, privy to a, a meeting this week in a, a subdivision here in Lee Summit and uh, 
there was an unfortunate event that happened over the weekend, and uh, just even more of the the uh, happenings and the things that we learned by attending that meeting and the discussions that were had were uh, were uh, if you didn't think they were already pretty good guys, they're pretty good guys. So um, the way they handled it, I think, deserves even more respect, and we sometimes think to give them because it. Uh, it could have been difficult. It was also very good for this neighborhood to uh, to come together. Um, there were uh, there was a, a real bonding of that neighborhood that was already in communication with each other. But all of the the parties there were really uh, really interested in what was happening, and uh, it was a, a nice job of representing uh, our city and, and what we do in, in handling those situations. So um, thank you. And then, Mr. Mayor, I as an elected official, I do have the opportunity to say that, that in terms of the ballot issues, I would. this is our last meeting prior to the election, so um, I, I would urge our citizens to consider a no vote on one and a yes vote on two. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Other council roundtable? Very good. Uh, staff roundtable? One of the things that I uh, am proud of regarding this organization is uh, two words that we use quite a bit. It's called continual improvement. And you see it a lot uh, with our accreditation programs that we have uh, with our, uh, hopefully our fire, we'll know in a few weeks, our fire, police, uh, public works, and parks department, uh, and also throughout many of our other departments. So I bring um, a recommendation to you in that spirit of continual improvement, of uh, strengthening and making uh, some things stronger for us. Strengthening, uh, I used that word once already, sorry. Okay, um, so the charter allows, uh, and maybe we put this on the overhead if we could, uh, Nigel. Uh, the charter has a section in it uh, that allows audits and reviews to be conducted. Actually, we do an annual uh, performance audit already. Uh, it's a part of our budget process. You all, I make it a part of my uh, annual report to you. I actually bring it to, to note when I present the annual report, and you all uh, approve it, uh, the type of area. But at any time, we really can do any type of uh, performance audit that we want, want to conduct. And it says under the charter, uh, the council upon its own initiative or upon a recommendation of the city manager shall provide for periodic management performance reviews um, and then it uh, or performance audits this is word for word out of the charter uh, of this of the city operations programs or other matters so <clears throat> tonight uh, what I would like to do and it's something that really has been um, on my mind for a while but I think there's been some recent um, discussions that bring it a little bit more um, to a more of a relevant point is I'd, I'd like for us to take some time um, to have an outside auditing firm come and do a performance audit on our practices, procedures, processes of our uh, uh, purchasing and procurement process. That's a little alliteration, isn't it? So um, <clears throat> what What's happened for us, really, is that we've engaged in some new modern techniques uh, on how we do purchasing, but we really haven't done a redo on our policies and procedures. And a quick example of that would be uh, we introduced to this organization purchasing cards a few years ago. And purchasing cards, yes, they're credit cards, and, and no, not every employee gets a, a credit card from the city to go out and buy what they will. These credit cards are actually um, specifically designed uh, through our banking system that they can be limited to certain types of items that would be logical for that employee to purchase, such as going to the hardware store. So we might have an employee that has a purchasing card where they can buy uh, hardware supplies, those kind of things, but they can't take it to Summit Grill or Third Street Social or Llewellyn's and have an enjoyable weekend with, with their friends. Um, so th these things are really restricted on the types of items that can be purchased as well as the amount of uh, money that can be spent on them. So they've been a great uh, asset to us because what happens is um, we get one mega uh, credit card bill at the end of the month, every month, there's a lot of, I'll tell you, there's a lot of um, tying those back to the departments and the uses and stuff, but we cut, then we just write one check 
for to that credit card system, and then we just distribute the cost out to the departments according to the purchases that were made. And that really has helped us. It is uh, as, e as efficient as we try to be. It can be expensive for the city of Lee Summit to cut a check by the time you go through the beginning process to the end. Um, Conrad, you want to take a guess on how much it takes to write a check? <clears throat> I actually did a uh, analysis of it many years ago, and even 20 years ago, it was $20 to cut a check. Today, it's estimated closer 40 to $50. Wow. So what happens is you start writing check after check after check. The purchase cards really are helpful. So purchase cards have been great. Um, the thing that hasn't been great with the purchase cards is that employee out there making that individual decision at that time uh, do they know and do they understand our procurement process and our purchasing policy process? So that is just really, that's just one example of where we've engaged in new techniques that we think have created uh, higher levels of efficiency, but we haven't hit the pause button, taken a look at our policies and our procedures and say, now that we have these new um, instruments or vehicles or, or techniques, um, what does that mean for our control and for our um, making sure that we're using um, the public funds in the very best, best way possible. So um, what I'd like to do and what I'm asking the council um, to um, hopefully to agree with is that in the very short uh, period of time in the next few weeks um, to work on a scope of review, um, perhaps work with the finance and I would look at the mayor pro Tim Vinny if he would consider maybe assigning it to the Finance and Budget Committee um, for them to uh, look at a scope of review that would look at our uh, current purchasing structure, our control methods, uh, our operating procedures, and make sure that we have what I would call best management practices and procedures regarding our procurement activities. And then specifically why I do bring up the purchasing card is that um, that purchasing card really introduces a lot of um, concepts that we may not be aware of. For example, what is a transaction? As you know, we have a purchasing policy that has limits per transaction. Well, what is a transaction when you're using a purchasing card? Is it that one individual that buys that item at the hardware store? Um, or is it a culmination of everyone who bought that same item within that month of time? Those type of things um, where it's going to be very helpful for us to have clear um, policy definitions that can guide our employees in making some of these decisions. And so what we would do is um, actually take a look at the purchasing card activity like for the last year and ask our auditors to, to culminate and go through uh, those transactions and for them to find the policy issues that we really need to address in order to have a good, a good policy, a good procurement basis. So. Um, my request to the council, according to the uh, uh, charter, is that uh, I am recommending that we provide a uh, performance review or performance audit for the uh, procurement and purchasing uh, division activities. This would include the City of Lee Summit as well as the Parks Department. In the charter, it states that the Parks Department uh, policies uh, regarding purchasing should emulate the city of Lee Summit. So anything that we do and we find that needs to be an improvement either in the Parks Department or in the city of Lee Summit, we need to make sure that system is consistent uh, throughout the entire organization. So I've had conversations with uh, Mr. Lovell and he's uh, certainly supportive of that. Uh, Conrad has been very helpful in getting me to this point um, where we are tonight. And then I've also had conversations with Ben uh, Kalea, um, who is our Director of Procurement and uh, he is definitely supportive of this as, as well. So, Mayor, thank you for the time. I apologize that it wasn't something posted um, on the agenda in advance, but uh, it's something I think is fairly timely that I'd like to move Appreciate swiftly it. on. Thank you. I do mm -hmm. have one question here, Councilman okay. Moseman. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Steve, I appreciate you you taking the initiative to, to bring this forward and stuff, and it, it's a good thing and, and probably pretty timely, and, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Charter does allow it, so that's good. I did have a couple of uh, quick questions on it and, and comments. Is uh, obviously we'd want to be thorough on it. Uh, so, were you 
limiting it to the P card use? Well, um, that's again that that can be for the scope. Uh, as far as a financial, when, I, when we say a financial audit, most of this is a performance audit. The what I use the term financial audit would be where we were actually going to give them every single transaction of the of the P card for them to go through. The other thing I might mention, um, Councilmember Mosby, is that um, it, early September, like uh, right after Labor Day, we are going to have our annual financial audit for the whole organization, which which we do. So. My thought, my goal was if we could do this, say in August, in the next few weeks, that if they found some areas of concern uh, through this uh, performance audit in the financial audit of the P card system, they could hand that over to um, the financial auditing team. Um, the way our financial audit works right now is they do, um, Connor, what was the term that you, you use? Random? That they'll, they'll go through every system and they'll just pull random samples from systems and if they if they look clean and good uh, they move on if there's something that looks a little hazy then they dig in with a little more detail so councilmember mosby what um we were looking at maybe doing the financial audit for the purchasing card uh and then allowed this auditing group to give recommendation to our um financial auditors that do the entire organization, any kind of pointers or things that they thought needed additional work. Okay. So the performance audit would, what would, what's your tenant, what's your view of what that scope might be? I understand mm -hmm. that you're saying a financial audit of just the P card. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. And then the performance audit would be, uh, tip, typical auditors, they come in and they, they just get a snapshot of what are you doing right now? And you know how do how does what are your operating procedures today? And a lot of times, in given the amount of time this happens in organizations, what you're doing versus what's written sometimes becomes different. And it's not that anybody is doing it with ill will or bad purpose, but just like the P card system, new things get introduced. And so what we want to do is take a snapshot of how is it actually working? What is the real what's the real process? what is the written process, and then what is the best management practices that other governmental entities have, in, you know, have done uh, that, we could, that we could borrow from and have a set of recommendations. And uh, eventually, Councilmember Mosby, what I see this auditing firm do is to bring a comprehensive um, set of policies and procedures on how to operate our purchasing system including the structure, the division of duties. Um, one of the things that I'd like for us to talk about is we've been decentralizing some of our purchasing activities over the last five to seven years. Some of that has been because of the recession and uh, we were needing to cut administrative positions in order to um, keep our budget balanced. Uh, but I do ask myself today if some of that decentralization has caused some confusion and maybe some inconsistencies throughout the organization. Thanks, uh, and, and I'm not trying to be act like I'm certainly not any any accountant or anything like that. I'm far from that, and I'm not a, really an auditor or anything. But I did do a little bit of research lately, and it appears there's a uh, organization AI. Uh, what, what is this here? This is the mm -hmm. AICPA. It appears to be American Institute uh, of Performance Auditors or something like that. Okay. Or maybe Conrad is it something else? Oh, oh, CPA Certified. Okay, Certified Public Accountants. There you go. Uh, uh, <laughs> they have uh, some guidelines, and and one of them generally accepted government auditing standards. You know, and I don't know if that a perf it appears it's under a section of performance auditing, Watch and it would, it would think that we would want to make sure that the auditor is following that, mm -hmm. if, if that applies. I, I don't know. I just, saw, I just read it recently and was looking at it under performance standards. And then also, I mean, Steve, as you mentioned, the performance standards, you know, we'd want them to be thorough, and I know it's going to go to the Finance Committee and then it'll come back here, but I think we should, we should contemplate that it will cover all aspects of procurement beyond the P cards, you know, of, you know, we say that we do this a thousand dollars, you know, you know, whatever. And, and, and are we doing that? And then we should have a time frame of parameters. It's looking at like the last two or three years or something so that we really get a full picture of it, uh, would be appropriate. And I know they start with objectives, 
will we get to see the objectives that they set as because performance auditors to do it under the best practices guidelines for that it says they start with objectives that they these are the things they want to accomplish will we get to see those types of things there will be a statement of work <clears throat> that would be presented uh, if the council agrees at the uh, finance and budget committee meeting and it would <clears throat> detail uh, the type of work that the uh, this compliance or performance audit would uh, entail okay all right and then you know i mean for us I, and i'm just throwing this out there is th that please consider uh is is uh bidding practices and non-bidding practices you know the whole gamut of things uh you know and some lots of things are perfectly fine and, and probably 99 percent of everything we do is great uh and then uh you know the flow of monies and transactions that that go with those uh, you know, where, where does, you know, who's paying for it and, and what, how is it paid for? That sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah. And actually, <clears throat> we have a, several bodies that dictate how government accounting is conducted. Uh, you mentioned the GAS, the Government Accounting and Auditing Standards. <clears throat> That's one that the auditors have to conform to. They actually will mention that uh, in their opinion, that they do a, a systematic evaluation of our internal controls, <clears throat> and then they do, as Steve mentioned, testing, uh, random sample testing of transactions to verify that the internal controls that we tell them we have in place are, in fact, uh, followed. And then based on that, <clears throat> they can render an opinion as to whether or not the financial statements are accurately reported. But in this case, you're actually dealing with more of a compliance uh, type audit. <clears throat> and so that's the reason for the difference in scope. Yeah, I mean, the, the performance audits are much different. And, and I spoke with a, an old government friend of mine in, in the federal, and, you know, he was saying that it, it's really a different animal than, uh, you know, a, a financial audit type thing. It's, uh, and that's why, I mean, he said that's why a lot in the, the feds, that's why they're not liked, is because they do go in and say, well, you said you were going to do it this way, but you did it this way. And then and they look for the rationale, and sometimes they say, okay, well, that makes sense. And then sometimes they say, good, but we need a little, maybe I suggest a tweak here, that sort of thing. So, and that's what I'm kind of thinking. I'm, and like I said, I really appreciate you bringing this forward to us. Uh, it, it's timely. And we just want to make sure, or at least I do, that it, it's as thorough as we can be. I don't think we've ever done it, so maybe we never have to again, but it would be ideal uh, to be good at it this time, and then we can really learn from it and, and don't get back. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Moreno. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Arbo, following the um, audit that you guys are putting forward, what will be your next do you, next steps? Have you kind of established that, or are you going to wait for the results to, to figure out from there? Uh, absolutely. I, I think that um, waiting for the results um, is really going to be the, the, uh, the best way to not create confusion. I mean, I could, I could begin making changes immediately, you know, on, to internal uh, policies and procedures, but then what would happen is a few weeks later they change again, and there'd be further confusion. So I'm... Um, uh, so basically, we're going to. I'm hoping to, to get these people in a matter of weeks in here working and in you know starting to give us some recommendations. And um, part of your uh, following the audit, I think one of the things that's fairly clear is there was a little bit of a discrepancy in terms of the staff understanding um, staff communication, some of the staff understanding you know, the state laws, the staff understand mm -hmm. communicating with each other about, hey, I'm going to purchase this, you're going to go purchase that. You know, there was a lot of miscommunication. So will there be a training with staff following this? I think that, uh, you know, I want the auditors to make the recommendation. I think they're, they're, they're probably going to give us some training components that we can, that we can do as like uh, employee orientation and those type of things. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you asked, I bet if you went out in the field and you ask a typical employee, where is your uh, policy and uh, your procurement policy, I, I really doubt that anybody could show you where that is. Um, you know, they just rely on 
other people in probably in the office to help them with that. So what happens is you get uh, a field employee that gets a P card and uh, they're working on a project and they need to go buy some lumber or something like that, but off they go. And sometimes what would happen is they would purchase things that we've already um, have done a competitive bidding process on and we have a contract for, but they didn't know that we had that contract. So these are the things that we were kind of finding out that are important for us is to, without overwhelming our employees, they already get, they already have to know a lot of information to do their job well. So um, the challenge is how do you provide them information that's useful uh, and helps them make the right decision and not do something that's against a policy. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say real quick that our staff is, we have a fantastic city staff yeah. in this, in, and they've done so much for this community. And um, like you said, we, there's always room for improvement. Yes. One of the things that I, I'm hoping um, that we can see from this is, um, is not only better practices and a more mm -hmm. efficient government, but also um, maybe some training with our department heads about ways they can improve communication inside their department. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think, like I said, some of this is a communication issue that yeah. auditors can't, you know, they're going to make recommendations. But some of this is an organi organizational structure issue, mm -hmm. lack of communication flowing down. Um, and I think I would just like to see that at the end, whatever, wherever this goes, a component of some kind, training the original, the staffers, yeah. but also a, a, maybe a communication plan from department heads about how they can better communicate with the, with the staff on their end. About these policies that are in place, right? Uh, policies yeah. and purchases and, yeah. and all that stuff, yeah. I think so. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Council Member Faith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Steve, just a quick um, question. Is there a percentage, uh, what percentage of, of P card purchases and procurements versus other ways of, of procuring? It, is there any? Uh, Professor Lamb could tell you that. Yeah, yes, thank you. I'd, Thought Professor Lamb might be able to. Last year, <clears throat> we purchased over a million dollars worth of goods and services with the P card. That's on a hundred seventy million dollar. Again, the majority of that was purchased within <clears throat> a few funds. The general fund being sixty million dollars, Parks being several million dollars. So, uh, less than a hundred million dollars of the budget. So. Uh, one million of that was done through uh, P card purchases. Uh, the other items <clears throat> that are fairly large, obviously, would be water purchases uh, and uh, our fuel and things like that. Well, not necessarily with with the dollar amount on on the on oh it, the amount of transactions. The amount of transactions, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Uh, I I'm did sorry, I wasn't actually, clear on that. Uh, 8,757 transactions. So that saved us that many checks. To Out of, right, times 20 or times 50 or whatever, times 50, right. Yeah, right. And I, I, anyway, I think that's fantastic. Um, I think that's a great place to start. And I, I just want to echo that um, the, the staff members that I've talked to this week and um, um, definitely in, including uh, the director of parks, um, Tom Lovell. I spoke with him a little bit this week, and everybody has been so open to this process and so willing to lay it out on the table. Um, I, I look forward to this, and we're going to, this is going to make us stronger. And thank you. Thank you. Councilman Redson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we've just kind of circled around this, and I, so I'm just going to ask it straight out. Uh, so in the performance audit, not only do you look at best management practices and procedures and make sure that what you're doing is what your policy is, mm -hmm. but there's also an aspect in there to make sure that what we're doing is compliant with state law, correct? Um, that, that's correct, yes. Okay. I mean, that's part of our lessons learned uh, of the recent days is that, um, again, great staff here, but they 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 were focused in their world you know of of good in good uh, government practices here and uh, now that we now we know that the that there are um, other laws that are that could impact our decision making process here so that needs to be built into the into the policy as well sure. and that was just a question yes oh well the answer is yes okay <laughs> <laughs> councilmember Seif. thank you thank you mayor 
uh, one of the things I just want to make sure that we're all in agreement on is that we're asking uh, the mayor pro tem to uh, put it to committee, but it sounds like we're on a very, very short time frame for that to happen uh, with the next or the actual budget meeting coming up. So, yeah. Um, I mean, very close. Yes, and, and, it, August 1st is the next right. meeting. And so we got to make sure that we get that on that agenda. Uh, so I urge the, the mayor pro tem to do that. But the if, mayor pro tem has to get it on there. Thank you. And I am particularly pleased that you do have an aggressive schedule. Mm -hmm. Well, our, again, our game plan is, is to try to get that wrapped up so that when the financial auditors come, the, they've got something to work with. So right. Thank you. Um, any further? Staff no, sir. Uh, I'll just wait for um, action of the council on this matter if if it is taken, and we'll Very leave good. it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have consensus to send. <laughs> yes. Good. We have consensus. Thank you. Uh, meetings adjourned. Thank you, everybody.